Hi, this is Pat Moorhead, and we are back for another episode of the 6-5 podcast. We are virtually doing the end of event analysis of the Global Foundries GTS 2023. What does GTS stand for? It is the Global Technology Summit. Daniel, how are you doing, my friend? Yeah, you know, I'm always happy, Pat, when we have the chance to tear down a couple of really action-packed days talking semis, talking about what, AI, automotive, getting to the edge, some really exciting partnerships, and of course, really, Pat, pulling the threads, tying together what's going on in the industry and why Global Foundries has had such a successful ascent, especially in the years following its uh, recent IPO. Yeah, it's crazy, Dan. I remember 10 years ago talking to you, literally a major business news outlet, top three. And they said, you know, I don't know if we're going to cover chips anymore. My editor doesn't think it's interesting uh, with, uh, with technology. You know, and I did a massive eye roll. Uh, but, you know, as we like to say, uh, chips are eating the world as much as software is. And you can't run that fancy software on, on air. And then, and then the, um, the dark days hit. I'm not going to use the P word three years ago. Um, but well, you don't want to get that, censored. <laughs> I don't want to get censored and, or some warning underneath our video, but the, uh, I think we all learned even down to the consumer sitting at the dinner table, how important semiconductors for, uh, were. And it's, it wasn't just the bleeding edge, right? I mean, it was the, uh, 12 cent PIMIC that went into the radio of the hundred thousand dollar car right? That uh, was driving people uh, crazy. And then here we are, AI crazy, right? With uh, NVIDIA going off the rails, uh, a lot of the uh, companies that are a part of that ecosystem uh, getting a, a ton of interest. And literally, I don't know, Dan, have we been at 100 virtual or in-person events since November about generative AI? It, it's crazy. Yeah, you, you make a really good point. And all this AI is only possible because semiconductor companies building everything from the most advanced GPUs to FPGAs and ASICs to, you know, low power sensors that end up exactly. pulling all that data that we need to do all the really cool things that we're hearing about on our, you know, big, powerful supercomputers. And so these things are very intertwined. And it, it's kind of a nice segue, Pat, to to yeah. Global Foundries, you know, you talked about that inquiry you had, you know, a decade ago, and it's pretty laughable. I have to imagine that producer is probably unemployed at this point because there was there isn't really a part of the tech stack that is more readily covered because of its implications on not only technology, but national security, global yeah. policy, technology leadership. It's great that you got that SaaS application, but like you said, try running it on air. You can't right. do that. And so... You know, this really interesting inflection here, Pat, comes back to, hey, we live in a world where we need a whole continuum of processes and every device that we use, whether it's the new iPhone 15, I want to do this so I can check my phone, <laughs> or whether it's a, you know, a legacy of, of automobile or an appliance is full of semiconductors. And in some cases, you've got, you know, these three, five, seven nanometers that everybody likes to talk about. And that's what most of the media focuses on. And then there's, you know, the 20, 30 nanometer plus technologies that are still in all of these devices, in many cases, doing very important things. And Pat, if you tried to buy a car during the P word, um, during that time when the supply chain got absolutely annihilated, yeah. you may have heard at some point that the reason you didn't get your car wasn't because they were missing some advanced process chip that was used for something. It was literally some very old legacy bus that might be used to control the, uh, the, you know, the adjustments on your seats or something very simple like that. And then literally they could not finish a product. So, hey, we are doing the end of event coverage for GTS 2023. But for those who may not be aware of who Global Foundries is, man, Dan, can you talk about who the, you know, who the company is and, and, and what they do if they're unfamiliar? 
Yeah, of course. Uh, Global Foundries was founded in 2009. It was actually spun off of your old, um, yeah. you know, stomping grounds. I saw you on CNBC recently. I think it said former corporate fellow AMD. I I'm never, it. I'm never getting away from that. Am I? Never getting away from that. But that's also an honor. <laughs> you were one of the youngest ever in that role. Um, but they were founded in 2009. You know, originally a private company in 2021 became public. But they're one of the world's leading manufacturer of. You know, they position it as essential chips. We could sort of say there's a few different ways. Sometimes people call it as older process. Sometimes people call it lagging edge. But these are really important semiconductors that are utilized, as I made, as I told the story about phones and cars, to basically uh, manufacture almost everything that we use that is uh, electronic or that uses electro electricity. Um, it's a global company, so it's not yeah. just a name. Uh, they have a footprint. Uh, Fabs in Singapore, Fabs in uh, Europe, in Germany, uh, in the U.S., big presence in New York and uh, Vermont as well. Um, and they're really well known, Pat, for the work that they do in a number of, of adjacencies, but auto, which we've hit on, but they work yeah. in the data center, home and industrial IoT. And then, of course, they're part of Smart Mobile. And they really like to kind of remind everybody out there that basically there's not a device you can buy that doesn't have some part from Global Foundries. Yeah, it's a, a really interesting company. And yeah, it was a spinoff from AMD. Uh, there were some acquisitions and the company really does, you know, I, I like to call it a uh, specialty fab in, in areas. It, it's funny, Global Foundries does what Intel doesn't and, and, and a lot more, right? I think that that's the simple way that I sometimes uh, explain this to people. So the company had uh, uh, GTS 2023, you and I, Gosh, watched, I don't know, six hours of a video. We were not able to uh, attend, but but it's a great show. And it, it's what you would expect from an ecosystem show, right? We go to a lot of ecosystem shows, uh, some of them from chip makers, some of them uh, are industry shows, uh, IaaS, PaaS, SaaS providers. And this is their ecosystem show. This is where other uh, OEMs, uh, 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 Fabulous uh, semiconductor companies, OSAT companies, EDA, IP companies, IP companies like ARM uh, uh, come in, uh, EDA like, uh, in fact, uh, the show seemed like it was majorly sponsored by Synopsys uh, and Cadence. So um, uh, the companies that know, do IP and EDA. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, there were a bunch of keynote addresses. They went through the roadmaps, uh, a bunch of demos. We didn't get to see the demos because we weren't there. But uh, gosh, I think I've been to five, uh, five or six years of it, and it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. And you know, as you would expect, right? You have headliners, right? CEO uh, Tom Caulfield uh, kicked it off. Uh, but the the two other headliners were uh, a gentleman that you and I know quite well, Charlie Kawas, uh, COO at Broadcom. He essentially runs the entire chip business uh, for Broadcom, and uh, John Forsyth, uh, CEO uh, from uh, Cirrus Logic. So the highlights are what you would expect, Dan, uh, in, in how you position the company. Right? They talked about uh, ultra low power technology platforms that they had, and remember platforms right is is basically a flow it's a process right uh, rf and millimeter wave connectivity solutions uh charlie hit on that uh big time and very localized low power uh intelligent applications uh with secure non-volatile memory technology that's another area that uh that they hit so talking about exactly what you would expect uh, at at a at an ecosystem uh, event, so a lot of key themes that that you know it's funny it's hard to go through six hours of videos and maybe walk away with with a few themes, but we're going to give it our best shot uh, uh, possible and really follow the lead of CEO Tom uh, Caulfield. So Dan, what what were some of the themes that uh, that you walked away with? Well, first of all. You know, Global Foundries is among the biggest companies in semis that oftentimes no one's heard of. And I thought it was really important that Tom set the stage of why the company serves over 200 customers, why the company has 13,000 employees, 8 billion in revenue and 9,000 patents. And I only point yeah. that out because this ties to the first theme and that's AI. It's very 
easy in this current market space to anoint a very small number of fabulous chip makers as the king of AI, queen of AI, whatever you want to call it. Well, in fact, there's one uh, that's anointed. Even Tom kind of joked about uh, the definition of AI is, is NVIDIA. The biggest challenge is getting enough NVIDIA. Absolutely. But of course, Tom immediately set the stage that, hey, AI is important here too. The yeah. essentials, the specialty, however we want to define this, Pat, is that for AI to, to fully work, there are these virtuous relationships, and we'll come back to that in a minute, minute between the edge and the cloud. I would, and we'll talk about that more as a theme, because I think that was a theme too. But he yeah. really talked at, at very succinctly about the fact that these essential chips are critical to being able to deliver AI, whether that's AI in a medical device, whether that's going to be AI on your PC and smartphone, whether that's going to be AI in a, uh, in a smart appliance in your home. And then, of course, you've got things like infrastructure and 5G and networks that could be doing things that the silicon diversity that has to exist inside of this infrastructure is substantial. And that while, you know, we all want to think about the high power HPC running the biggest NVIDIA, Grace Hopper, you know, yeah. we also have to think about the all of the different specialty silicon that has to go inside of those devices that makes these uh, lower power, that drives efficiency, that can enable, you know, these systems to connect and network at scale. And so the first thing, Pat, that really caught my attention was, you know, while I didn't feel he over rotated because a lot of people I do feel right now kind of over rotate to how yeah. important AI is. I think he wanted to say, look, there are not going to be servers built. There are not going to be intelligent automobiles made. There's not going to be a future generation of smartphones that are going to have AI without the supporting cast of essential specialty parts that are going to come from Global Foundry. So that, Pat, was my first big trend that I saw from Thomas. Yeah, and I really liked how he pulled on history. I mean, I love to do that. I love to start with the mainframe and then go all the way, you know, through minis, client server, PC, smartphone, IoT. I loved how he 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 went through that. But what he did is he set up um, set up uh, what he called a virtuous cycle, which I wholeheartedly uh, agree. Which start, you know, is is the edge connected to the cloud? and then connectivity in the middle, and then AI adding value on top of that. And that's where, you know, going down to the funnel to, to, to see, you know, what's the unique value that Global Foundries brings and, and why are they really good at or why are they better than let's say a TSMC or, or a tower, right? So, uh, you know, to what you said before, um, he started with edge intelligence, which, which was like, all the data or most of the data that you're going to get that that may or may not be transported all of it to the cloud is going to be from the edge and he has a really good point and companies like qualcomm it's funny i think he him and intel global foundries intel and qualcomm might be the two companies who are hitting this the hardest but historically it's going to happen i mean there's more ml today dan on the edge than there is in the data center so i don't see why generative ai would would be would be any different uh, you have to connect the edge and the cloud. You know, how are you going to do that, right? Well, enter uh, companies like Global Foundry's uh, partners, like a, like a Broadcom, right? Integrated RF, right? We always like to say it stops at the modem, but it's the modem plus the RF systems that make this world go around. Oh, by the way, it's not just on a 5G smartphone. Every router, every device that's wireless uh, that's out there uh, has to have a uh, low power integrated RF, right? Fast switching, right? Dan, you and I talk about going from 5G to Wi-Fi to Bluetooth uh, on the same type of device. That is difficult. Uh, you and I have talked about millimeter wave and and yes, it does consume a, more, a lot more power than let's say sub six 5G. Uh, but millimeter wave, uh, not only for 5G, but also uh, for Wi-Fi needs to be the, the most efficient. And then he did, right, did, right, this just 
a fact. He wasn't saying, hey, it's it's all about the edge and not about the cloud, but he did talk about the monetization uh, of the hyperscalers and how, you know, you, you and I have talked uh, a lot in regards to, let's say, Broadcom and Marvell about, hey, okay, it's a copper world, but we are going to uh, f- uh, photonics. Global Foundries, uh, I wrote a paper on this. Uh, I do consider the leader uh, in foundry for um, uh, silicon uh, photonics and whether it's uh, connecting uh, in the data center, uh, an accelerator to another accelerator, a rack to a rack, a fleet to a fleet, a fleet to a data center, c- combining data centers, uh, uh, silicon photonics uh, is the way that uh, is the way of the future. And low power, baby, it has to be low power. So I would say that that second theme or the second thing that came in was talking about the virtual cycle between the edge and cloud, uh, which is connected by uh, networking and enhanced by AI. Yeah, I think that's a good one, Pat. And, you know, you probably couldn't have an event like this in a world that's so focused on meaningful management of resources without talking about power and sustainability. Yeah. Now, I know you and I, we get flustered at times with the sort of market washing that can take place with sustainability. Right. The chip industry is different because what it's able to design, when it's able to put lower power into these devices and literally elongate the battery life, for instance, of your phone or of a different device. This is creating meaning. Remember, there's billions of these devices out there. So yeah. even incrementalism here, small incremental improvements. Now, look, we all saw the Apple announcement. And yes, you and I, a little bit of snon. I said snon, <laughs> snooze and yawn when it came well, to like, good. oh, I, great. By the way, I might use that and not give you any credit for it. A snon. I would, you got a snon, you know, you got to tap awesome. and snon, you tap and snon. Yeah. But the, the you know, kind of like, oh, they said it's going to last a little bit longer. But you and I actually know that deep down that matters. Like we're bored yeah. because we want the next cool thing that's like next, you know, the Vision Pro just because it's something to really talk about. Right. But when you hear that, hey, Pat, you can get a super powerful laptop with connectivity that's going to last you 24 hours while utilizing all of the typical resources in a day without a charge. You know that you're, you you get that little sweat gland in the back of your neck. You're starting to think, I want it. I want that sounds like, you know, a computer I want in my bag. Um, and, and so these abilities for specialty uh, companies like Global Foundries to influence power consumption in these devices is really, really important. It creates lower TCO. It doesn't only drive more efficiency to the device. And it also does help companies meaningfully meet sustainability goals. Because in the end, most companies that are trying to meet the hopefully important parts of sustainability, lowering their carbon footprint, I'm not talking about offsets here. I'm talking about actually doing things that help lower their uh, their impact and emissions can do this with these kind of incremental items. You have a company of 50,000 employees, lower power PCs, more efficient automobiles in your fleet, uh, lower power phones, data centers utilizing less power. This stuff adds up, Pat. And Global Foundries has a role to play here. And I think Tom made that really clear at GTS this year. Yeah, I love, I love one of the things that Tom, Tom said. It kind of makes your makes your brain like do a do a, a second take was he talked about the beauty of how important it is when a chip is off. He's like, when it's off, it's off. And he talked about sensors, one that might wake up every, you know, second or so to see if anything's going on. Right. Did anybody say anything? Did, did, did something happen? Uh, if we didn't have these types of sensors, the phone might use 100 X more power than it does today to do some of these fancy uh, type uh, features. But I do like, you know, there, there are companies who greenwash this stuff. And there's companies that actually do something to lower the uh, amount of energy and improve the efficiency in global foundries is is one of those. So. Uh, Tom really capped off his his talk, and I, I, I thought this was a theme throughout the 
throughout the show. You know, even Charlie talked about partnerships from from Broadcom. Uh, but but Tom really came in strong, strong ending to talk about partnerships. Right. And, and it's so interesting. You know, we've seen Tom on TV so many times. He gets out there, doesn't he? And on the six uh, five. No, totally. Yeah, he's been on the six five a, a bunch of times. But he talked about partnering, uh, first of all, for, for, for innovation. And Global Foundries actually has co-development with, uh, with partners where they're not only putting in work, they're sharing some of the, the IP that comes out of that. That Charlie gave uh, some great uh, examples of that, uh, specifically around the new 9SW RF SOI technology for uh, 5G uh, applications. I thought that was a good good proof point. Um, they all, he also talked about economics, like, hey, no longer can one or two companies shoulder the burden, and therefore we're gonna share the burden. And there's been a lot of investments of customers, namely the auto manufacturers who have done uh, some long-term agreements. But you know, if companies like Global Foundries can, can have can can shoulder some more of the risk than the companies just going in it themselves. That's going to make the world go around. You know, we're in a, a risk reward uh, type of business, and putting up ten billion dollars for a new foundry uh, and bankrolling it, and having to put down the cash, you know, three years before you actually derive any revenue from it, is a risky proposition. So. I agree with Tom's uh, premise on on economic, and then uh, talked about something you and I love, and you and I have been spending so much time on secure supply chain. Uh, sometimes we call it de-risking China, right? Sometimes we call it other things, but uh, Global Foundries pretty much has a footprint uh, wherever their customers uh, need it. I won't hit the sustainability. Uh, part again, Dan, you did a great uh, job on that, but I kind of want to end on this partnership theme on something Charlie uh, brought up from, um, from, from, from Broadcom. He hit many times this open innovation platform, right? Uh, can't be, can't be a mainframe, right? How do we get open innovation platforms? I don't know if he was talking about AI. He probably was. Uh, there, but we can't have any type of mainframe type of platform. By the way, I don't mind mainframes. I kind of like them. And even Tom said uh, all these different things are additive. But but I think Charlie, you know, ended where he started, uh, which is open open ecosystems require uh, an open platform. And I liked to hear that. And I think that's part of a part of a part of a partnership. So if I can just add a little bit on the a color on this one. I think Global Foundries has really done a good job of uniquely positioning itself as an economic partner to its customers. Now, they've talked about this not just at GTS, but the long-term agreement is something that Global Foundries has really specialized in. And while some chip makers, and some foundries might be very opportunistic. We all saw how t opportunistic TSMC was during the period of time when we had the shortages. Uh, Global Foundries really le leaned into more predictability, long-term partnerships with companies like GM, where they basically guaranteed important capacity and guaranteed pricing, which as we know in the chip industry is a risky proposition, but it does create a certain amount of loyalty and dependency, codependency in a meaningful way between customers and foundry, where global foundries may not benefit from those massive margins when they can spike on the surge, but they also don't get hammered when you see these declines. And we've seen how that up and down and over a period of time, the strategy may really work well for the company because they know they have a guaranteed production volume and price to count on during both the peaks and troughs of the semiconductor industry. No, that's good. So there were a bunch of, uh, no, 
That was a good ending. I like that. <laughs> no, that's good. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I, I put you to sleep. No. <laughs> Not at all. No, Dan, I'm riveted whenever you say something. Oh, I'm thanks, just like thanks. hanging on to every word. I, I need to put Otter on and record it so I can just yep. steal all, all your All right. I got you. Just as my own. Let's go. Hey, it, you know, an event wouldn't be an event in tech without doing some uh, major announcements and there were three major announcements that were packaged up into uh, two big announcement. One was for automotive and one was for uh, 5G uh, RF uh, application. Dan, I know you are a car lover uh, here. Uh, I don't know if you want to dive into this uh, automotive. Yeah, I think uh, a good way to sort of wrap this recap is to talk a little bit about what was announced. Um, yep. Look. I just got back from the mobility show in Munich. I'm watching yeah, these did. trend lines, AI, you know, smarter cities, lower power consumption, sustain all the trends, software defined vehicles, all the trends that Tom Caulfield talked about at GTS were on display in Munich. And Global Foundries has a very robust business in automotive. He actually mentioned this. And in case it was a business that was in the low hundreds of millions just a few years ago. Yes. And now a billion dollar business yes. uh, in this in this particular space. And why is that? Well, first of all, the volume of semiconductors that are going into vehicles is growing exponentially. We're seeing average vehicles now that might have a thousand chips in them, a typical yes. ICE, internal combustion, combustion engine vehicle. And in these new electri electrified vehicles, or sometimes they call them ACE vehicles, you're seeing 3000 chips. Yeah. Now, as you're hearing about these companies becoming critical partners, or as I mentioned, long-term agreement for exclusive supply to a company like GM, you have an opportunity for a Global Foundries to be a massive beneficiary to a trend line like this. And why do I share that? Well, the company did roll out. Now, the, again, bear with me here because these parts can be a lot to digest. But <laughs> it's the 40 ESF3. Auto Pro 175 technology. Got that? Yeah. You ready to place your order? But in all serious, <laughs> I'll take uh, uh, I'll take a hundred million, please. It's a extension of the company, what it calls its Auto Pro platform. That's a little more digestible, um, and it gives the customers a broad set of IP of technology solutions uh, and manufacturing capabilities that basically speeds up time to market. And why is that important? Let me tell you why that's important. We all know the life cycle and design cycle of a vehicle can be many years. When we've heard companies like NVIDIA and Qualcomm talk about design pipeline in automotive, that often means business five, seven plus years in the future. That's right. But we all know with AI, ADAS, electrification, that there is absolutely no way companies can continue to build vehicles that don't have meaningful software defined feature upgrades that are going to happen on nearly an annual basis. Cars. Here's a quote for the day, will be like iPhones. They will get launched two times a year and there will be almost no change from the last version, but people will wanna buy them anyways. I'm kidding about the no change, but it'll be very incremental. They will be able to make very incremental and continuous changes. We've seen how Tesla has been able to build a very dynamic brand around the ability to constantly change and update. So while the specifics of the announcement are fairly complex and we will put the release in the show notes if you kinda of wanna read that off. What is happening is A, is you've got this trend line of shift from, shift from internal combustion to um, electrification. You've got ADAS, you've got telematic systems, navigation, you've got uh, infotainment systems, and you need to be able to build these more like building blocks. And so what Global Foundries is announcing with the extension of capabilities to its Auto Pro platform gives its OEM partners the ability to move faster in their design cycles in partnership with Global Foundries. And I think... This is a, a strong move at an important time to support this rapid growth business for the company. Yeah, it's a, it's amazing how the car has become, I mean, you can look at it as a smartphone, you can look at it as a data center on wheels, but it's a software defined uh, piece of machinery. Um, some people say, gosh, why do you worry about power as much as you do in let's say a smartphone right well what happens is increased power efficiency means higher longer range inside of a, an electric car 
And what is, I would, I would claim the number one attribute for electric cars is how far you can go on a charge, right? I mean, the difference between, you know, 600 and 800 horsepower off the line isn't as much, but it's also keeping people from buying electric cars, right? Because they, they fear that uh, they're not going to be able to uh, plug in enough. And, you know, part of these solutions that they brought out, this, um, uh, you know, an, an update to their BCD light and BCD platform is to improve power inversion and conversion. It sounds boring, but it's, it's super uh, important because you might have five or six different voltages flowing around in that car that, uh, that, that need to be uh, regulated. And my, my take on the Auto Pro update is time to market. I think you had mentioned that, but it's pre-certifying under auto, auto conditions like temperature um, uh, that enable them to hit time to market. Three years instead of seven, seven years. I think you had brought in if I, if I heard you correctly. I didn't say so, that exact timeline, but I was trying to basically help people understand that right now when you would partner with a, with an, with a, with a tier one, on, on components and semiconductors, it would typically take seven or so years. And we're gonna see that. My joke, Pat, was it's gonna be iPhone cars, meaning every six months you're gonna get a new one. Um, yeah. And you know we won't get there right away, but it, it, that's directionally where we're heading. Wow, I hope it's a lot more exciting than the, the iPhone. So you're gonna get new mirrors it. that fold a little <laughs> bit differently, but don't yeah. worry, Pat, you're gonna be able to go like this and answer your call. While you're in the car, I love that. So, hey, the the second bundle of of announcements were around something that uh, Global Foundries is very successful at, and uh, we heard echoing from uh, Charlie Kawas at uh, at Broadcom, and that is five G RF. Uh, the company brought in uh, nine, a nine SW RF RF SOI. By the way, SOI silicon on insulator. Uh, gives you uh, much better uh, power than what we call bulk. And that's the material that you use as, as the substrate. And it's funny, I was trying to figure out, uh, hey, what does nine mean? What is nine about? Well, nine is bigger than eight. Uh, and eight was what they had before. They had eight SW. And this one uh, is improved 10% smaller volume and uh, 20% uh, enhancement in in efficiency. Uh, again, I keep bringing up Charlie, but Charlie told some good stories. Is is they co-developed this uh, with uh, uh, with uh, Global Foundries. By the way, do we know the customers that uh, Broadcom uh, supplies for uh, a lot of their uh, RF stuff? I think we do, and I think uh, they had a big event this week. Uh, RF uh, front ends are not just for smartphones, though. They're also for uh, Wi-Fi. They're for Bluetooth. You need an RF front end every time you want to go from uh, digital to analog. And that includes Bluetooth. That's Wi-Fi. That's 5G. Uh, the cool part about this goes all the way up to uh, sub uh, 8 uh, gigahertz. And that's uh, some of the fancy uh, new wireless that's coming down the line. Wow. There was a lot in this event, Dan, you yeah, know, there really was. And I think it's not only about the event, Pat, but I really think it is about talking about the role that a pure play and an essential partner yeah. has to the entire technology ecosystem. And I so often think it's missed. You started this pod with your story about a conversation 10 years ago. I can tell you, I had a recent conversation with a, with a journalist that kind of asked me a question along the lines of, um, you know, do you think it frustrates Global Foundries that they're not more well known? And yeah. here's the thing is, I think Global Foundries knows exactly what it's doing. The people that need to know what Global Foundries is, know what Global Foundries is. And investors that understand the importance of the continuum of process technologies to make the world work, realize how uniquely Global Foundries is positioned because these leading, these fabulous companies can't manufacture. The yeah. IDMs are putting most of their weight towards leading edge. Um, and the fact is, is over 80% Pat of silicon that's in devices is still higher than seven nanometers. So if you're a global foundries, I'd be saying, I like our prospects. Now right. it'll never be the headline 
that, you know, an NVIDIA chip or an, an, a bionic A17 chip is going to give on a day in and day out basis, Pat. But sometimes I don't know how you feel about this. Good business is good business. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you don't always have to be in the big uh, in the big headlines. But, you know, when cars aren't shipping and devices aren't shipping because of some of this uh, specialty uh, silicon, you know, you don't want to be in the headlines uh, for that, but but you can be. And, you know, Dan, something we don't talk about a lot with Global Foundries too is there are a ton of people who still have their own fabs, right? Like uh, Skyworks, as an example, on Semiconductor, uh, Texas Instruments, right? They still have their their own fabs, and you know, as as you have um, the combined R and D of Global Foundries partners and, and themselves who are working with them, you have to ask yourself. Hey, when now to be clear, nobody is a pure play and does all their own silicon. I think everybody does some business with global foundries, but you have to wonder how long can the on semis, the TIs, uh, folks like that, um, you know, not be doing all of their stuff in there. And I think what you would do is you would start to see that uh, once uh, global foundry starts lapping uh, the the competition on its capabilities and once you start um, uh, seeing people maybe lose market share uh, because uh, they're not uh, dealing with uh, leading edge. I mean, even Intel as, as an IDM uh, does, you know, 10, 15%, maybe more of its silicon at, uh, at TSMC. So yeah, it's something we don't talk about it a lot, but uh, whatever we discussed on this podcast kind of got my, my brain moving uh, on the opportunity for, uh, for Global Foundries. But isn't it wild, though, uh, a company like Global Foundries uh, can span not only from the smallest uh, ASIC and, and controller for IoT to connecting the largest hyperscaler data centers with silicon uh, photonics. It's kind of cool, right, that the variability of, of, of and the importance of, uh, of what the company does. It absolutely, Pat, makes the company one of the most important names in the business, whether you've heard of it yep. or not. Another great GTS, Pat. Yep. Really glad we had the chance to sit down and riff. Got to hear from so many thinkers. Of course, CEO Thomas Caulfield, Charlie at Broadcom. We heard from the CEO of Cirrus Logic, but we also heard from a number of the executives across the Global Foundries family, and there's so much yeah. expertise at the event. So hopefully... This was a great way for you out there to learn a little bit more about what Global Foundries did at this year's GTS. If you like what you heard here on the 6.5, we have a show every single Friday, except for the ones that we don't. And of course, we've got a massive library of executive conversations that we hold at our annual 6.5 Summit or, of course, at our various 6.5 on the roads. But Pat, for this show, for the GTS wrap-up, it's time to say goodbye. Thanks, Global Foundries, for your partnership. See you all later.